Can't you just feel it? The conflict is becoming apparent in our culture. It reminds me of those words of John Paul II. We're now living in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the antichrist. And if we don't choose to know God's word, to believe God's word, to follow God's word, we're going to be a sitting duck for all kinds of confusion, all kinds of disorder. Those are really important choices that people have to make. And these choices are difficult. Who am I going to marry? What kind of life am I going to live? How am I going to raise my kids? What am I going to do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? And I have to make a choice today. Jesus says to each one of us, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. The question is, do we want it? Welcome to another amazing week of the choices we face, where we can take a look at the choices we're about to make in our life and seek God's wisdom for making good choices. Peter, it's good to have you with us. It's good to be here with you. Yeah, well, you know, what we're going to see now is something kind of special in my own life. Uh, you know, it was when I was a senior at Notre Dame and I made a Curcio weekend retreat, which is a you know weekend of renewal, came out of Spain, thoroughly Catholic, lots of people have been renewed through it. But anyway, I made it. And then I began to work for the National Office of the Curcio Movement. That's how I got to Michigan. But then when the Catholic Charismatic Renewal broke out, I got fired from the Curcio Movement. <laughs> I got banned, you yeah. know? And then uh, a couple of years ago, uh, they had the big big anniversary celebration of the Curcio in the United States, and they asked me to give the keynote talk. So it was really oh. like a, kind of a special homecoming and then being able to be with that movement that had meant so much to me. and so. I talked about some stuff that we talk about all the time that's so important and so basic. And so it's about prayer. And so we're going to watch that and then we're going to talk about it. Good, let's do it. In that same letter that John Paul II wrote, he also said in order to really make progress in the spiritual life, we really have to reconnect with the spiritual wisdom of the church. And then he mentioned in particular doctors of the church. Now, who are doctors of the church? There's only 35 or 36 doctors of the church. They're, they're saints that have been recognized by the church as not only being holy, but having a depth of wisdom that's useful for the whole church. Some were chosen because of their expertise in systematic theology or interpreting scripture or moral theology. But some were chosen and recognized because of the depth of wisdom that God gave them about how do you make progress on the spiritual journey, a practical wisdom. Saints like Teresa of Avila, saints like John of the Cross, Spanish, by the way. I was just reading a little talk that Eduardo Bonin gave in Canada, and he was quoting Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross. So this is part of the, the patrimony of the founders of the Curcio movement, the depth of Spanish spirituality in these great doctors of the church. Uh, John Paul II also mentioned St. Catherine of Siena, St. Therese of Lisieux, and there's doctors of the church like Francis de Sales and Bernard of Clairvaux and St. Augustine. Now, right after I made the Curcio, I, I, you know, I was just overwhelmed by the greatness of God. And I just wanted to be one with him. And I knew there was a lot of depth in writers like John of the Cross. So I picked up a book by John of the Cross and about maybe 60 pages into it, I put it down. So I said, I don't understand what he's talking about. And what I do understand sounds too negative. So then about 25 years later, when I was taking a class on Catholic spirituality at the seminary, I read another book by John of the Cross. And this time, like, all the lights went on. Like, whoa, this puts together everything I ever wondered about, everything I hoped for, everything I couldn't understand. And all I can say is that the Lord maybe knocked enough hell out of me so I could begin to understand it. And, and, uh, but also a special grace of understanding and, and being able to share it. So over the next 10 years or so, I, I went through each of the doctors of the church in the area of spirituality, and I was struck by the harmony of what they were saying, and I thought if you could ever put this together in an orderly, clear way, you'd have a tremendous guide for the spiritual journey. So that, that's what I did with this book called The Fulfillment of All Desire. And 
uh, Wang, Huang, oh, I'm so bad at languages, the administrator of the Curcio office <laughs> ordered a hundred of these because it meant so much to him and he thought it would be useful for spiritual growth in the Curcio movement. So there are those in the, in the bookstore. So I wrote those and put it together in, in an orderly way and lots of people are using it in small groups. Uh, uh, you know, and, and, and it's, it's, it's really been helpful. But in, in these doctors of the church, John Paul II identifies four basic principles of the spiritual journey. I'm gonna run through those as much as I can in my remaining time. First principle, the spiritual journey is totally dependent on the grace of God. I actually found that rather good news to find out because my own effort to make progress on the spiritual journey wasn't totally successful. And I said, there's something missing here. And Therese of Lisieux particularly is a tremendous teacher of tr dependence on God. She writes in the story of her soul, she says, I've been in the convent almost seven years. And she says, almost every time I go to pray, I fall asleep. Well, when I read that, I woke up. <laughs> I said, golly, you could have sleepy prayer times and somehow be a saint. How does this happen? And she only had another year or two to live. She, she entered the convent just short of her 16th birthday. She died at the age of 24, suffocating from tuberculosis. And she only had a couple of years to live. And she says, you'd think I'd be absolutely discouraged because the whole life of a Carmelite is to pray. She says, I'm not. And the reason why I'm not discouraged is that I know that God loves me even while I'm sleeping. And there's a line in one of the Psalms that says, the Lord gives the, his beloved while she sleeps. So we can claim that scripture passage, right? <laughs> she also goes on to say, I know that God loves me even while I'm sleeping because I see that when parents put their children to bed, they love them just the same. Uh, as a parent, I might add that sometimes when we put them to bed, we love them even more. <laughs> they finally stopped screaming. It was driving me crazy. I was losing my holiness. <laughs> and, then, and then she says, I also know this is true because I see that surgeons put their patients to sleep when they're doing life-saving surgery. So Therese's confidence wasn't in the quality of her prayer times. Therese's confidence was in the power of God's love to take her sleepy prayer times and work transformation in her soul. And that's a very important principle of spiritual life. Teresa of Avila writes in, in her, one of her books, she says, for the first 14 years after I renewed my relationship with the Lord, I couldn't pray without the help of a book because my mind was like wild horses with thoughts going in every direction. You don't start off in deep contemplation uninterrupted by sleep or distractions. And, Tr and Teresa of Avila says the most she's ever been in that kind of really deep contemplation, she says the first time is for the length of a Hail Mary, she says it's never been more than a half hour. So there's always a bit of a struggle in prayer. There's always a bit of kind of re regaining our focus on the Lord. And, and, and sometimes we get pictures of the saints and we forget that. We, we forget Therese falling asleep. We forget Teresa of Avila being distracted and needing the help of spiritual reading to, to really keep focus on the Lord. Second principle of spiritual journey. Even though the spiritual journey is totally dependent on the grace of God, our effort is necessary. It's not sufficient, but it's necessary. What kind of effort? First, the effort of paying attention to God. You know, looking at Jesus, as Teresa of Avila says, I think that the most important decision I ever made in my life was the decision I made on the Curcio to swallow my pride and humble myself and admit that Jesus is the Lord. He's real, he's risen from the dead, he's standing before me, he's inviting me to be his disciple and to say yes. I think that's the most important decision I've ever made in my life. The second most important decision I think I ever made in my life was to begin to take some time each day for personal prayer. Now, a lot of times, you know, we, we go to mass and that's really, really super special. 
It's the height of Christian worship and prayer. But like in a human family, if we just had meals together and never spent one-on-one -on -one time with our father or mother uh, or brothers or sisters, uh, there'd be something missing in the relationships. And so we really need to balance the prayer of the mass, the, the community prayer, with one-on-one -on -one time with the Lord. And every saint says this, taking some time every day to be with the Lord in personal prayer is really, really important. And lots of times, whether it's in Curcio groups or charismatic groups or marriage encounter groups, sometimes I'll just feel, and I'm not feeling this here, I'm not trying to discern anything here, that people have kind of leveled off in a certain way and have just kind of stayed in the same place and they're celebrating a past experience rather than going on in relationship with the Lord. And so I think the thing that makes the difference there is taking some time each day in personal prayer. Uh, St. Francis de Sales, who wrote the first book of spirituality for lay people, Introduction to the Devout Life, says busy Catholic lay people shouldn't pray any longer than an hour a day. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's okay to, to react to that. Unless you have the permission of your spiritual director, but they should pray an hour a day, he says, because they're busy Catholic lay people. He says, how do you expect in all the demands of your life, of work, of family, uh, of all the interactions you have with people, all the busyness and challenges in your life, how do you expect to be there led by the Lord, attentive to the Holy Spirit, if you're not spending some you know, substantial time listening to the Lord and being quiet? You know, be still and know that I am God. Now, in my prayer time, sometimes I'm quiet, and sometimes when nobody's around, I'll walk around and sing or shout or whatever, you know, or, you know, but whatever, whatever keeps me awake, whatever keeps me focused, you know? But, but just prayer before the Blessed Sacrament is absolutely wonderful, but if you can't do that, do it in your home, do it, do it in your car. But as much as possible, build into your daily life some time for personal prayer. I really think it's the second most important decision I ever made. It's one of the reasons why I'm still here today. I, I think the third most important decision I ever made was to get into a group reunion. And it's not always been a formal group reunion, but I've been in a small men's group for 50 years. And that's been really important too. When, when a brother falters, we need to reach out and help them. We need to pray with them. We need to encourage them. We need to, we need to help them along the way. And people have helped me and I've helped other people. Now another, and, and we have such tremendous helps for doing this in prayer today, like that little Magnificat. You know, I'll, I'll, ideal for me is going to early morning mass, staying after mass to have a time of personal prayer. Uh, if I'm awake after Mass, which oftentimes I am, uh, I'll just be with the Lord quietly and just be grateful for the amazing gift of the Lord giving Himself to us. And if I start to drift off, I'll get out my Magnificat and do the morning prayer and then go over the readings again. And then when it comes time for intercessions, I'll get off my little list of people that I'm praying for and then read the, the meditation. And if it's not by a German theologian, I generally understand it. Uh, <laughs> And then I read the life of the saint, and those are so inspiring. So many martyrs in the life of the church, so many Vietnamese martyrs and, and Hispanic martyrs and, and English priests. That, I, mean, I mean, just so many people have had the courage to be loyal to Christ, and we're going to need that courage in the days to come, really. Really difficult decisions are awaiting Catholics in the days ahead. Tremendous pressure is coming on people to, are you loyal to Christ? Are you loyal to the prevailing secular pagan culture? It's going to be very, very hard for people to remain faithful to Christ unless they have the support that we have, like in, in like groups in the Curcio movement and other things like that. Okay, what else can we do? We can turn away from those things that block our relationship from growing or slow it down. How, how are we doing? Good. Oh, good. I feel good. 15 minutes. Okay. I, I can do it. I can do something useful in 15 minutes. And this next stuff I'm going to be telling you is some of the most useful stuff. Sin blocks our relationship with the Lord. And the first thing the saints tell us is we have to turn away from serious sin. Now, when you talk about serious sin these days, you can't really count on people understanding what that is. Like, 
like, what are you talking about? Like not believing in global environment or, or you know, warming or not, not, not recycling? Is that, is that what you're talking about? Well, that, that certainly has a moral dimension to it. But so many people have heard these days that God isn't concerned about these little personal things in your life. I mean, that's no big deal. The church is hung up on those things and we're getting over it now. But as a matter of fact, besides the big global issues, God is very concerned about those personal choices and actions we take in our life that most deeply affect our souls. Not to recycle is at a much further out level from sins that really impact our soul and our relationships. So we have to remember what St. Paul says about serious sin, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, don't let anybody deceive you. And there's huge deception in the, in the environment today. There's huge deception even in the church. He says, don't let anybody deceive you. The immoral will not be able to enter the kingdom of God. The fornicator, the adulterer, the person who engages in homosexual activity, the thief, the robber, the miser, the drunkard, the idolater, and then all kinds of other lists. People who commit serious sin and don't repent will not enter the kingdom of God. And that's why evangelization is so important. We're not just about offering people an enrichment for their life. We're offering people the chance to save their life like my life was saved. I had to repent from serious sin in order for the grace of God to become effective in my life. We talk so much today about God's so merciful, he'll never let anybody be lost. God is so merciful, he doesn't want anybody to be lost. But that mercy isn't like automatically imposed on people. It has to be received. There has to be a yes to mercy. There has to be a humbling of ourselves to admit that we need mercy. There has to be an acknowledgement of sin in order for the forgiveness of sin. And this is the message of St. Faustina. People don't know that that's part of the message. Time after time, Jesus says, you know, unless people avail themselves of my mercy, unless they say yes to my mercy, they'll, they'll perish for all eternity. It isn't this kind of cheap mercy. It's won at an incredible price of the blood of Jesus Christ. And it, there has to be a yes to it. There has to be a humbling of ourselves. There has to be, just like happened to me on the Crucio, we have to humble ourselves and accept the mercy of God and repent and believe. So the first thing is turning...